Hey, my name's Caleb, and I'm the pastor at Cross of Life, and we're so thankful that you clicked on this video. We really pray that it benefits you, it grows your faith, or maybe introduces you to Jesus in a way that you've never been introduced before. But what we also want for you is to be connected to a local congregation. So if Cross of Life is your home congregation, we're glad that you make use of these resources, but make sure that this never comes in the place of coming together for worship with the body of believers. Let's be a church that values in-person gathering when so much of life is digital. And if you're somebody who's not from Mississauga, uh, get in touch with the local church in your area. It can be so easy to pick and choose, oh, I like this preacher or I like this message, but never actually invest in the place that Jesus says that he is, in his body, the church. And we encourage you to take time to put yourself into his body, in a local congregation, so that you can pray for one another, love one another, support one another, forgive one another, do all the things that the scripture talks about for one another. So we hope you're blessed by this video, and we hope that we get the chance to see you in person sometime soon. So we're at part three of our mini-series on the multicultural church. So far, we've looked at the challenge and the solution. And then last week, you were generous and allowed me to go serve our church body as a circuit pastor. Um, One of my responsibilities is to help the churches in our geographic area of our church body. Um, And so the vicar from Hope Lutheran in Toronto came over and filled in for me last week. Thank you for letting me do that. We're picking up that mini-series now, the solution, and then finally the model. We're going to look at a a church that is embodying this spirit of a multicultural congregation. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 11, verses 9. 30. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed uh, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called called Christians, first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is God's word. Like I said, we're going to look at a model of the multicultural church that embodies the principles which we've been talking about for the last couple weeks. And that is the most important church in Christian history that most of you have never heard of, and that's the church in Syrian Antioch. I think if we would think of what are the geographic centers of the early Christian church, we might think of Jerusalem. We might also maybe think eventually of Rome. But very few of us would say Syrian Antioch, that was the hub, that was the center of the early Christian church. And yet it seems from the scripture that that was the case. Because they embodied the spirit of the multicultural church that God was creating through his Holy Spirit. So that's the church we're going to look at today. Syrian Antioch, if you don't know where it is, I couldn't find a better map than this, so I apologize that this isn't a super good map. But it's right there on the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea, right where you can see that star. Uh, It's a really interesting city. It has quite an interesting history, which we'll walk through. But before we get there, I want to outline where we're going to go today. Um, We're going to talk about the origin of the church there, the outcome of the church, and then finally the outgrowth. So the origin of this church in um, Syrian Antioch has to start with the origin of the city itself. The city was started by a man named Seleucus. If you don't know Seleucus, you probably know his boss, Alexander the Great. Uh, When Alexander the Great conquered all of the lands that he conquered, at the end of his life, he basically said, all you generals fight over this property that I have attained for myself. Um, There was quite a bit of conflict between Alexander the Great's generals, but eventually it formed into two sections of Alexander the Great's empire, and one of them was owned by this man. 
Greece. It's called the Seleucid Empire. Seleucus put two major cities in his empire. One of them he named after himself, Seleucia. The other he named after his wife, Antikia. Antikia became the city Antioch. And as most men know, especially on Mother's Day, if you're going to get your wife a, good, a gift, you want to make it as beautiful as possible. And that's exactly what Seleucus did the city of Antikia or Antioch. Antioch was a magnificent city. Uh, in fact, it is said that the main street through Antioch was five kilometers paved in marble. The amount of money that was put into this city to make it beautiful was extensive. As a result, many people came to live in Antioch. Uh, many will say that at this time, there were maybe close to 500,000 people who lived in Antioch, which was a massive city at that time in the world's history. What was really interesting, though, about this city is how Seleucus set up. Because of its geographic location, kind of at a crossroads for anybody coming from the north side of the Mediterranean Sea to its eastern uh, seaboard, he made it into 18 different sections. Instead of just putting walls around the city like you would normally do, he put walls within the city, segregating it into separate sections. Those separate sections became inhabited by different people groups who were passing through the city and eventually would stay in the city. So if you were Greek, Jewish, or you were Roman, or Egyptian, you would go to your of the city and live within the walls. Before you think to yourself, that seems kind of weird, remember that we live next door to a city that has little Portugal and little Italy and Greek town and Korea town and the Danforth and, and so on from there. Ethnic communities that gathered together. And while there might not be walls between those communities, they were certainly gathering in the same spaces. The other thing that's important to know about this city, Syria and Antioch, is that it was far away from Jerusalem. As far as the early Christians were concerned, Syria and Antioch was nothing. It was way out at the ends of the earth. In fact, the only reason that they end up going to this city, you find out in the early part of the text, is because of the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed. As he, uh, was killed. Remember this, back in Acts chapter 7 and 8, we hear the story of Stephen, the first martyr, being stoned, and we find out a persecution breaks out in Jerusalem as a result. And so the people who don't want to be persecuted, they start running for their lives. And they get as far as Syrian Antioch, right? The text says that some of these men, even though the rest of them were only speaking to the Jews about Jesus, went to Antioch. And they started to speak to the men and women there. So we find out at the beginning of this church in Antioch that persecution is what got it started. Persecution is what got it started. I think we tend to think most churches start because of the intentionality of maybe another congregation or a church body, but uh, actually what happens very often is that a church starts because people are scattered unexpectedly and unintentionally. One pastor has put it like this, it's sort of like when you blow a dandelion, you know, the dandelions have all uh, sprung up at this time of year, and now some of them are turning white, right? And you know if you pick one up and you blow on it, you destroy the dandelion, and about 50 dandelion seeds go flying off to start new dandelion patches. Something similar is happening with the Christian church here. Although it looks like the church in Jerusalem is being destroyed, really what's, got, what's happening by God's will is the church is spreading out. But it also made me think of us. And many of you are here because of persecution. You didn't have a life trajectory where you thought, I'm going to end up in Canada at some point in my life. But life happens, things happen, evil people do evil things, and here you are. And while you haven't necessarily brought the gospel to us, we have the gospel here. What you have brought is an encouragement in that gospel, a joy in the face of persecution and struggle, a faithfulness to God and his word, an intentionality to make his word and sacraments a priority. I mean, many of you said when you got here, one of the first things you did was try to find a faithful church. Where for many of us who live over here, when we think about moving, we think about 12 or 15 other things before we think about, is there a faithful church where I'm moving? Persecution got this church started, and as a result, because these people had nothing else to rely on, no life that they were trying to make for themselves, they were just trying to get away and rely on the love of Jesus, this church actually took off. So the church in Jerusalem hears about this, and what they do is they send Barnabas to this church. 
Now, I think there are two reasons that the church in Jerusalem sends Barnabas up to Syria and Antioch. The first of those is maybe pretty pragmatic. It's just for leadership, right? This is a church of just lay folks who have gathered around God's word, found others who believe in Jesus, and there needs to be some organization to this group. And so they send Barnabas, who is familiar with how the church works and how it is organized, They send him up there, but I think there's a second reason for sending Barnabas to this church, and that's for encouragement. Encouragement. Like I said to the children, Barnabas is the nickname of a man named Joseph. The the name of the meaning is, or excuse me, the meaning of the name is son of encouragement. It seems that Barnabas' maybe natural default way of dealing with people was just to be that warm, inviting, smiley, loving person who you just love to be around. You know people like this, right? That was Barnabas. And that is exactly what this fledgling little congregation in Syria and Antioch needed. Because they were a congregation that was small in a big city. They were multicultural, dealing with the challenge of being multicultural. And they needed just somebody to come in there and say, it's going to be okay. Let's be patient. Let's devote our lives to Jesus. Let's continue to be faithful. Those are the things that Barnabas was really good at. And God blessed their ministry immensely. The uh, Bible tells us that the Lord's hand was with them and many more people were coming to hear the word and to believe in Jesus. And then Barnabas did something crazy. The text tells us that he went and found Saul and brought Saul to Syria and Antioch. Now, if Barnabas is the son of encouragement, then Saul is the son of intellect. I mean, Saul was educated at the highest level of basically anyone in theological training at that time. He had been visited by Jesus, given the Holy Spirit through his baptism, called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And if you read any of the things that Paul writes for us in the scripture, they are thick theology. In fact, Peter himself says in the Bible, sometimes people have trouble with Paul's stuff. (laughs) Because Peter even understood Paul is operating at a high level of intellect for us. So Barnabas goes and finds Paul, Saul, and brings him along. And why? Because what Barnabas understood is that both encouragement and intellect are needed in a congregation. Of course, it's great to have encouragement from your brothers and sisters, but they can't be without a thick, deep knowledge of what the scripture says and what it means for our lives. And as we think about what it means to be our congregation here together, I think we have to say both are needed. And I think if you would look at me, you would probably easily put me into one of these camps. I'm not the most encouraging person all the time. I would love to be. I want to be. It's just not something that comes naturally to me. I'm much more likely to open a book than to call somebody on the phone and see how they're doing. Intellectual is probably my default setting, but both are needed. In fact, I would say when I stepped into Cross of Life six years ago, I I almost immediately thought this is a congregation that needs a couple more Barnabases, or Barnabi, or barnacles or whatever. (laughs) Because I know my skills, but my skills are only part of the equation. And I actually think one of the reasons that there are so many of you sitting here happily gathering on a Sunday morning is less because of me and more because we balanced each other out. Some of you who have been here for years, decades, stepped up with a spirit of encouragement to love one another in a way that I'm just frankly not capable of in a lot of cases. And then new folks came into our congregation with that same spirit of encouragement. Those people you know, you love to see them on Sunday morning because they come up to you with a smile on their face and an encouraging handshake or hug. The people who are there for you when it's sad, when it's difficult, when it's challenging, you know what that feels like and both are needed. So the origin of this Christian church in Syria and Antioch is the spreading of people from persecution and then leadership that is both encouraging and intellectual. But I think the whole of this is summarized in this one word, humility. The humility of every single person along the way as this church finds its origin is impressive. The humility of those people who are persecuted to go engage a culture that they're not part of, they're not from Syria and Antioch, but to go into that culture and and to say, I have something that I think is valuable for you, and I'm willing to adjust to you. I mean, look at the the text. It says most of those Jews from Jerusalem didn't go and speak to non-Jews, but some of them said, we will. We'll go step out of our comfort zone, and we'll go speak to these people who we would normally not interact with. And then Barnabas who comes in with a spirit of encouragement, not the on-high leader from Jerusalem, but the servant of all of them. 
And then Saul, who comes in and teaches with an intellect that I'm sure he had to adjust to a Greek-speaking audience. I mean, this is a man who's been a Jew his whole life and has been educated in Jewish theological schools, and he adjusts. And then congregation, to say, we're going to take this leadership from outside, right? The, The Greeks who are in that Syrian Antioch church to receive Barnabas and Saul, Jews from Jerusalem. And then finally, I think Barnabas, I mean, the man was killing it in ministry, right? Like, he was the pastor who had the growing congregation in the world mission setting. Like, he's the type of guy that fits in magazines or in video announcements because he was really good at his job. And yet he said, I need Saul. I need someone to balance me. And as we think about what it means to be a multicultural congregation, can we embody that same humility? It says, I might have been here for a really long time, but I have the humility to adjust to you who are new. Or you who are new coming in and saying, I know I'm stepping into something that has history and culture. To listen to one another as we have things to share with each other, whether it be from the pulpit in God's word or in your personal conversations. The encouragement that you can have with one another. The need for one another to say, I don't understand this. I'm a corrupt human being. I need you to walk with me and help me and teach me. If that humility is embodied in our congregation, what we see as an outcome will be the result. Which brings us to the outcome. What happened to this congregation as they were learning from Saul and Barnabas? What they embody is three characteristics, three, maybe you could call them core values for their congregation. The first of those is a spirit of outreach. Of course, you see multiple times in the text, not just from the origin of the congregation, but as it continued on, it had a spirit of reaching out to the people in their city. They were constantly trying to find opportunities to speak God's word. And maybe a word on this, as we think about what it means to do outreach in our context, I think we have to realize that what they did is the same for us. It is going to be just speaking to other people, personal conversations, personal interactions. When you're in a multicultural city like Syrian Antioch or a multicultural city like Mississauga, everything works a little bit, but nothing works well. Because there's too much variation between people culturally, demographically, that if you put together a church program and say, this is how we're going to reach our community, you'll reach some people, but you will not reach the vast majority because everything will be too culturally specific. Outreach has to be something embodied in each individual in their unique station in life with their sex, race, age, origin story, flaws, skills, experiences, all the things that make you you perfectly placed in the place where God puts you to reach the people that no one else could reach in the exact same situation. Because you're you and the Holy Spirit is empowering you to reach the people that you uniquely know. So they had a spirit of outreach as a congregation. They also had a spirit of discipleship as a congregation. Remember, they brought Saul in so that Saul could teach them that thick, deep theology, those hard truths of the scripture. They weren't there just because it felt good to be about Barnabas and get a hug every Sunday morning. They wanted what the scripture had to say, and they wanted to learn it to the core. And the same has to be true of us. Some of you love that social, beautifully encouraging community that we have here. But you struggle when it comes to taking notes on a sermon or getting into a Bible study with other people, taking time for a personal devotional life. You like the social part of church, but you you don't want that deep theology, that deep discipleship. And equally, I would say the opposite can be true. Some of you are jumping on the next Bible study that's available, but when it comes to making a conversation with somebody you don't know at church, or trying to get active in somebody else's life when they have a need, you shy away from that. You scroll on your phone a little bit longer, you leave early from church, and it's not that any one of those is uniquely sinful, but that it betrays an attitude towards what we're doing here together. There has to be a discipleship of the scripture and a discipleship of people to learn what it means to be an encouraging brother or sister in Christ. So outreach and discipleship, and finally, compassion. At the very end of the text, we hear this uh, short little narrative about a prophet named Agabus. Agabus will come back later in the book of Acts, actually, uh, prophesying something else about Saul. But here he prophesies that there's going to be a famine in the Roman Empire, and he was right. This happened during the reign of Claudius. But as soon as the church in Syria and Antioch heard about this, the first thing they thought was, not, let's prep. (laughs) 
let's make sure we store all the grain that we can and all the water that we can and all the resources that we can. No, they thought, how can we store it to give it away? How can we support the Jews in Jerusalem who are going to suffer maybe the worst because they are the center of this fledgling Christian um, movement? And the same would be true for us. If we had a characteristic of compassion towards those who are in need, we would be embodying this multicultural church spirit, which I would love to praise you on. I think many of you would attest to both participating and receiving from the compassion of our congregation that we have been able to do that in the last couple months. May that always continue for us. I've, I, we had a conversation in our Saturday morning Bible study this uh, yesterday about um, how congregations can tend to be a little bit more focused on people's spiritual needs or their physical needs. I think those of you who have been here for a while, you would say Cross of Life probably focused a little bit more on spiritual needs. But we've been able to move that needle so there is a balance that we care about people's physical needs as well as their spiritual needs. Now, the result is that the text tells us that they were first called Christians at Antioch. So these three characteristics completely changed who they were so that people actually had to name them something different. Christian is not a name that we took for ourselves, folks. This is a name that other people gave to us. And it's because we embodied something so unique that they couldn't call us anything else. Uh, To show you that, the current Christian was given to us, first of all, because we were internally different. We were internally different. Um, The Christian community bypassed those segregated walls of the city of Syria and Antioch. You know, in general, at that time in the world's history, if a a person was from a certain ethnic group, you kind of knew just about everything about them. You knew their religion, their politics, probably their dietary restrictions, maybe even their schedule, because people's ethnicity determined a lot about who they were. And so they would stay together in their little enclaves in the city of Syria and Antioch. But all of a sudden, here's this group that is bypassing those barriers, They're not just acting like Egyptians or Jews or Greeks. They're acting like something different, going beyond their ethnic capacities and their religious and political and dietary and and cultural um, norms to be with each other. And would that be the same of us? That people would look into our church and say, I don't really know what to call that church. They're not really traditional. They're not really contemporary. They're they're not really black, they're not really white, they're not really old, they're not really young, they're not really anything that I can name exactly. Like, that's my dream, and I think the scriptures model. That people would look in here and say, I don't know what that is, but it seems like it's gathered around the word of God. And I hope that would be true of us, so much so that people couldn't classify us by our denomination or our worship style or ethnic majority. But the Christians weren't intern- only internally different, they were also externally different. As they interacted with the city around them, they treated every single person differently. In fact, what linguists will say is that the term Christian, or in Greek, Christianoi, means literally from the party of Christ. It was a political party term. So think the same way that we have liberals or conservatives or New Democrats or Green Party in our political system, The people looked at the Christians and said they don't fit in any of the political ideologies that we have, so we're going to have to give them a different political party name. What if we engaged our community the same way? That people would look at the way that we show compassion on people, or have patience with people, or love those who are different than us? What if we valued all of the things that Scripture says, even though some of them probably fall more on the right side of the political spectrum and some fall more on the left side of the political spectrum? What if no one could say that's a conservative church politically or a a liberal church politically, but that it's a church who serves our community in a completely unique way? What if when we reached out to people with the gospel, instead of just focusing on the scripture and what it says, we loved the whole person and invested in them as a person, not just as a checkbox of trying to get another person into our church? Friends, if you want to call yourself a Christian, this is your heritage. You can check a box on a census form or put it on your Facebook profile all you want, but this is what it means. It means to live a life on a different trajectory than everyone else around you, to be part of a different community and to serve your community in a different way than everyone else around you. 
This was the outcome for the Syrian Antiochian church, which leads us to the outgrowth. As a result of this congregation and its growth in Syrian Antioch, breaking down ethnic barriers and political ideological barriers, something beautiful happened. Did you know that all of Paul's missionary journeys start from Syrian Antioch? When I was in school, this was like one of the most annoying things that my teachers made me study, was all of Paul's missionary journeys and where he went and all the different cities and when he stopped and the whole thing. And guess what? We'll go through that over the next couple years of our study of Acts. I won't make you memorize it, though. But one thing that you should know about every single one of his missionary journeys is they started from Syrian Antioch, and eventually he ended in Syrian Antioch. I mean, if the Apostle Paul had a home congregation, it was this church. And this church empowered him and Barnabas and those other ones who went along with Saul on his journeys to do that kind of mission work. Antioch became a church that was focused on spreading the gospel everywhere. They saw themselves as uniquely skilled and positioned to spread the gospel to all nations, like Jesus commands us. Why? because they weren't a congregation that was tied up with a certain ethnic or cultural identity, and they were positioned at a crossroads of the world where all sorts of people from all over came. They felt themselves particularly positioned to share that gospel everywhere. And friends, this is us. Obviously not to the same extent of the Syrian Antioch church yet, but isn't this eerily similar to what we experience? A church of people gathered in a place where many people don't stay for very long, of many different ethnic groups, not because maybe many of us chose exactly to be in this place, but here's where we are, and that we would overcome the challenge of a multicultural church with the solution of the gospel, to love one another not because of where we came from or what our skin color is or what worship style we prefer or how well we know the Bible or how well we're living our Christian life, but simply because God has baptized each of us into his family. And that if we would do that and focus on a spirit of outreach in every single person, a deep discipleship in scripture, and a love for every person's physical needs, that we maybe could position ourselves at this crossroads of the world to serve many other places. Many of you know our church body is mostly a Midwestern American church body. We're out here on the outskirts of our church body, much like Syrian Antioch was on the outskirts of Jerusalem. But God did something amazing through that little church. And it would be my dream, and by the uh, the scripture's example, that we would be a church that would use our position and the community that we've gathered to serve all sorts of people everywhere. I mean, what if in 100 years from now, people talk about Cross of Life in Mississauga and the ministry that it did, not just to serve this community, but to start new churches and to train pastors and to send out missionaries across our nation, and they never remembered any of our names because we were part of something together. That no one remembered Pastor Caleb, Pastor Schultz, whoever comes after me, but they remembered the spirit that that congregation embodied. It's only going to happen by the Lord's hand. We can't pull all the levers and make sure it happens this way. This is Jesus who's going to make it happen, but I pray that he does. And as I look out at you and I hear the conversations, I think it's possible. So let's pull together on this. Let's press on the gospel. Let's love one another. Let's be patient through our multicultural differences and see what God builds among us. Let's ask for him to come and do that. Lord Jesus, we ask that you come like you did to the church in Syrian Antioch to bless us as well, to give us a love for your scripture and a love for each other and a mission heart that sees our positioning as perfect for spreading the gospel to more people across Ontario, Canada, and even farther. And we ask that even if you do not accomplish those things, you help us to rejoice in the community that you have given us, to love the scripture for what it says about each of us, that we are loved by you despite where we may come from or what we have done or not done. And let that peace dwell in our hearts richly through the scripture, our songs, and our encouragement with one another, like Barnabas encouraged the church in Syria and Antioch. We ask all these things in your name because we want them desperately and only you can do them. Amen.